Then, once we've passed through the FAT and everything's okay, we will then ship the site. There'll be the installation and the commissioning done and the final validation before startup. Now, interestingly enough, You'll see it says here, cybersecurity audit. I always recommend people to do a cybersecurity assessment when it's on the shop floor. In other words, part of the FAT could be a cyber FAT. Because at this point, you can do penetration testing. You can physically introduce network storms. You can do things to see if the devices are hardened well enough so that they will not allow denial of service and that they will be there to operate. The reason being, if you wait until you get to site to do it, then it's going to be expensive to try and correct things. Whereas if it's on the shop floor, you've got a chance to, to do any remedial action. And I'll give you a real example. We got asked, about four years ago now, we got asked by an end user who had subcontracted to the integrator to provide a subsea wellhead control system. So this thing was going to be on the, on the seabed and of course there was an umbilical connecting it to top sides. So the client, naturally enough, wanted to make sure that the communication was robust. <clears throat> so he hired us to go down, and it was in Houston, to do a simple communication robustness test, which basically means you just flood the um, communication channel to make sure that the controllers and anything else connected to it would be able to respond and handle a network storm. So our engineer went down and by the time he got set up, ready to go, it was lunchtime. So sales guys being sales guys, of course, they swanned over and took the customers out to lunch. So whilst the customer was at lunch, they decided to run the test. Now, this was a hot standby, not a truly redundant, it was a hot standby system. So there was a primary controller managing the IOs, etc., and a secondary controller as the backup. So he started the test, and within a couple of minutes, the first controller locked up. It locked up wasn't communicating, wasn't controlling, so the secondary controller, of course, took over, took over the bus, and within two or three minutes, it too locked up. So now you had a subsea wellhead control system completely dead, because the controllers had both timed out, so there was no control, no communication, no safety, no nothing. So you can imagine that was squeaky botty time. They were all running around trying to figure out what was wrong with it. And what they found was, again, it was a software error in that the, the driver they'd written for the Ethernet chips on the controllers wasn't clearing the stack properly when it overflowed. So consequently, when the network was bombarded, it kept overflowing and then the software wasn't dealing with it and eventually it timed out and the controller went to its shutdown state and because the same software was in both controllers they both did the same thing. So that was found as a result of doing the network storm test, the CRT test. Now you imagine what would have happened if they had done that test when it was on the seabed, how expensive that would have been. So what they, they did was they did a temporary fix to prove that it would work, but they had to go back according to the requirements of 1511 and engineer the change correctly, which they did. So the point is use that opportunity on the shop floor to do those types of tests from the cyber perspective, because if you wait to get it to site, it might mean that it's going to be Expensive, not just that, but it may end up delaying starting up. And that too can be very expensive. So do it on the shop floor and then again do it after commissioning before you start doing the startup, pre-startup review. Because during commissioning, of course, people can be in there with laptops, with portable media, and they can introduce potential vulnerabilities. So you just want to make sure that everything is right. Because also the switches need to be set up correctly, the firewalls have to have the right rule sets in them if you've got firewalls. 
you've got to make sure the networks are segregated according to requirement. So this is a, a good opportunity to check all of that again. So you do the preliminary testing on the, on the shop floor and you can do the final when it's been installed and commissioned. Very important to make sure we do that. And then of course all the operation and maintenance procedures need to be in place. Our operations and maintenance people need to be properly trained in the equipment and all of that has to be done before we get to do the startup. And at that point we would do our FSA 3. Our FSA 3 is our final validation, our safety, final safety validation before we start up to make sure that the as designed, installed and commissioned SIS and all its SIFs meet all the requirements of the SRS. So another way of doing that would be to do a trip test. You may choose to do a trip test on a sample. You may do trip test on all of them, depends on how many SIFs you've got. You can, doing the trip test, you can time it to make sure that the timing functions are correct and that the SIFs will respond within the correct time frame. You can also run through the proof tests because that gives you what I like to call a twofer. You get two for the price of one because number one, it'll prove that the maintenance people can run through the proof tests, give them confidence, and secondly, you might actually find potential problems before you start up which you can fix. So it's always good to do that. And then once you've done that and you've passed the FSA 3, then you can start up. Once we're into operation and maintenance, now we're under the, any changes, the management of change needs to be handled carefully. And this is where we would do another functional safety assessment on changes. The other thing the standard calls for is now a periodic performance review. So it uses the term periodic because, again, it's not going to tell you what that period is. You, as the end user, can define that, that period yourself. And you might choose the five-year window between PHAs because that gives you enough time to have done maybe two proof tests, three proof tests, depends on your frequency. You gather all the data, you can review the data, and then you can use that to feed into the, into the PHA revalidation. So you can then confirm, yeah, we assume this many, that we would get a, a, a demand every five years or every two years, whatever, and we can then see if we are. If we're not, we can modify things. So it gives us the opportunity to use that data to be able to modify uh, performance. And it may mean that we are able to stretch out the proof testing, which will also save some money on maintenance. So again, it's this balancing thing. If we do it right, we're balancing it. <laughs>